My name is Rachel Fahey. I am a faculty research assistant um, in the entomology department. Um, I work for Dennis Van Engelstorp, who is a honeybee researcher. And um, I'll, and also here with us is Lindsay. Um, and Lindsay, if you want to introduce yourself really quick. Sure. Um, thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Connor and Nicole for having us here today. Really happy to be here. So I'm Lindsay Barranco. I'm a graduate student in the Van Engelsdorp Bee Lab, and my research revolves around native bees, um, ground nesting bees in particular, and um, different ground substrates that um, support those bees. Um, but I will say, um, in terms of the Bee Lab um, in general, there are many graduate students and many staff members and lab members who support that lab. And that work revolves around the epidemiological um, study of honeybees. So looking at the incidence, the prevalence, and the distribution of disease. And Rachel will talk more about that work that the Honeybee Lab does. And then toward the end of the um, slideshow, I can talk about the native bee end of things and the small, we call it the small native bee lab and what goes on in there and what that research is about. So um, before Rachel starts, this is the um, Van Engelsdorp Bee Lab and some of the members of that lab. And they're involved in a host of different research supporting um, large and small honey beekeepers around the nation. And, and I'll hand it over to Rachel who can describe more about that. Yeah, so um, as Lindsay said, our lab is very diverse. We're a big lab and, um, you know, we research honeybees. So, um, so you can see here in the picture on the, uh, to the right, to the top right, that's a honeybee and to the bottom left, that's a native bee. So honeybees and native bees are very different. And that's why, I, um, you know, they're separate researchers. So Generally, you have your honeybee researchers and you have your native bee researchers, but we all are um, working to help bees. So, and I do honeybees. And so what I do for the honeybee lab is um, a myriad of things a lot, but I'll start um, on the main uh, function of the lab here, and that is working with commercial um, beekeepers. Commercial beekeepers keep oh, thousands of hives, and they really are nomads. They they are farmers in the sense that if you think about like livestock farmers, instead of cows, they have bees. So they. Um, you know, maintain these hives, they feed them, they take care of them, they make them strong, and then they also give them medicine when they're sick. Um, so if you think about hives not as just, you know, you know, individual bees, but actually a hive, so a colony, um, and, and look at it that way. So commercial beekeepers are all over the United States. They are mainly concentrated in, um, the South, so you'll have a lot of beekeeper, commercial beekeepers in Texas, um, Florida, um, also in California, and then North Dakota, Midwest region. And all these commercial beekeepers travel around the United States to pollinate crops. And a lot of these crops are, um, you know, the food that we eat. So for example, almonds in California, um, California produces 90% of the world's almonds, not just the US, the world's almonds. So that is the biggest pollination event here. And then, you know, all the other stuff, melons, cucumbers, cranberries, and like Massachusetts, uh, blueberries and Maine. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. And all these bees are being moved around the country um, on huge flatbed semi trucks. So it's quite an operation. And what we do here in our lab is we help these commercial beekeepers to find out what diseases their hives have. So that way they can make um, decisions on treating them. 
and treating them. So that's medicine they can give their bees to help with whatever ailments they have. Um, so sorry, that was a pretty quick explanation, but I'm gonna show you really quick um, what we do in our lab. And um, ideally I would be able to take you in the lab and show you all of this in person as we're checking samples, but this is the best that we can do in our current circumstances. And so what you're looking at here in this picture are samples. So each bottle there is a sample from a hive and that contains bees actually. So these are high, like kind of the equivalent of a blood sample that your doctor would take from you. This is a little sample of bees that we've taken. And each one of these bottles only has a couple hundred bees, which may sound like a lot, but when you're talking about a colony that has 10,000 bees, it's really not, you know, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket. So, um, so each one of these, and you can see they're labeled numbers, and that's so we can track them, and that way we can give the data back to the beekeeper. So every, when they're sampled, they're given a number, and then we report them back. Um, so what we look for primarily is called Varroa. Varroa is a mite that, um, in, uh, you know, is the biggest pest for honeybees. So these mites um, transfer viruses, um, they're just really horrible. They weaken the bees in general, but there is treatments for that. What you're looking at here is called a wrist action shaker. <laughs> um, so essentially, we add water to those samples that I showed you in this picture. We add water to it, we hook them on with these attachments, and then we shake them for 30 minutes. So once they're done shaking, there is a screen inside that attachment. So you can kind of see that there in the center. And what we do is we put them through a sieve and then, this is an attractive picture of me. Um, <laughs> we put them through a sieve and then we um, count the number of mites that come through. So um, essentially it's like a screen cell and all the mites will fall in there and we'll count. And that will give us a number of mites per bee count. And that is what we report back to the beekeeper. So, uh, and then what you see here in this picture is, you know, you see our data book. So that's where we record all of our data. So when we find mites, we record those numbers there. And then um, we also count the bees. So that way we know exactly how many bees are in each sample. Again, so we can report accurate um, result, or, you know, data to the beekeepers. And, um, we also bag up samples that you'll see in the right of the picture. And the reason we do that is um, we actually will crush those bees and look at them under the microscope for a parasite called Nosema. Nosema is a unicellular uh, gut parasite and it basically gives bees diarrhea and makes them sick. So this is just another thing our lab looks at, but um, essentially we mash up the bees, we put it on a slide, and we look at it. And again, we're recording data, and then we're reporting that back to the beekeepers. So what does this mean? In summary, you know, we get, you know, we have scientists that go out and they sample these hives. They mail the samples to us. We look at them for disease. We record that data, and we report it back to the beekeepers. So that way they can decide how they want to manage their operation. So we're not making, um, you, know, you know, well, I should say, we do make recommendations, but essentially it is up to the beekeeper what they want to do with this data. So um, that's that. Um, in addition to this, I work for the National Honeybee Survey, and that is an APHIS grant funded. So APHIS is a branch of USDA, which monitors um, invasive pests. Um, and part of the survey is a national effort. So we're working with a bunch of different states and they send samples into our lab as well. And so for example, this year we have 40 states that are participating and we look at for disease and we look for invasives um, that are currently in other countries, but not here in the US. So we're constantly looking for that. Um, and just for context, you may have heard of the murder hornet. Um, USDA APHIS is also involved with that. So they're the first you know, people that 
had that monitoring place. So that's why that murder, murder hornet was found so quickly and taken care of, and that was because of USD aphis. So similarly, I'm looking for invasive pests to honeybees. So if we ever found one, um, you know, there is a emergency plan to contain that before it becomes like an outbreak. So um, at this point, <laughs> um, I am going to actually hand this back to Lindsay because she's going to talk a little bit um, about native bees and what she does and what the native bee researchers do in, in the honeybee lab. Thanks, Rachel. So um, just to distinguish the bees that are looked at in the native bee lab from the honeybees that Rachel was talking about. So you've probably heard in the news a lot about honeybee problems and honeybees as Rachel described are um, used and managed just as livestock is and moved around the country to pollinate uh, fruit and vegetable crops for, for mostly food production purposes. On the flip side of that, there are also 20,000, over 20,000 species of native of bees worldwide. And honeybees are only one of those species. So um, there are vast numbers of bee species, small bees, as you can see, and larger bees that Victor, um, who works in the native bee lab, is holding there in the box that are found worldwide. So, there are over 4,000 of those native bee species in North America alone, and about 430 bee species in Maryland. And these are really are the workforce of the bees. So we have um, managed honeybees that Rachel described that are moved around and used for specific purposes. But these bees are really the workforce and the pollinators of native plants. Everything else that's out there is pollinated by, by these bees. And they live primarily in the ground um, 70% of native bee species uh, live in the ground and they're solitary bees, so they're not living in a large colony in the same way that honeybees do. So if we look at the life cycle of the solitary bee, what we'll see is a female um, up top as an adult. She'll emerge from the ground where she stayed all winter long. She'll go out and mate. She'll then forage for pollen and nectar. And then to the right, if we looked at, look at that um, sandy um, patch there, that, that cavity, she'll burrow into the ground and she'll build a nest. And she'll deposit, before she lays an egg on it, a little ball of pollen and nectar mixed in with glandular secretions that that developing larva, that next bee will need in order to develop properly into an adult. And you can see this cavity is kind of darkened, so she secretes these glandular secretions and they only not not only have waterproof capabilities to protect that larva underground but also antimicrobial properties in there as well so she deposits that food source you see at the bottom the egg is then laid on the top of that so then as a, a larva that developing bee is able to eat that nectar pollen ball and that's all that larva will do it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger eat and eat and eat until it develops into pupa and at this point, the bee will stop eating, it spins a cocoon, and then gradually over time, it takes on those adult structures. So it'll develop the abdomen, the thorax, the legs, the head, the antenna, all of that is ha happening underground over a period of eight to nine months until that bee emerges again as an adult in the spring. Usually, if it's a specialist bee, at the same time that the plant is blossoming, that that specific bee pollinates, or if it's a generalist feeder and, and eats from a number of different blossoms whenever those blossoms are emerging as well. So that's a really important um, part of ground nesting bee life. So as I said, 70% of the native bees are pretty much stingless solitary females that go through this process. The other 30% are nesting in cavities like hollow stems, or little beetle holes in old logs and things like that. So um, we saw the picture of Victor holding the box of bees, and this is um, part of what happens in the small bee lab. So 
um, there are maybe four to five graduate students whose studies revolve around native bees. So there's a student uh, looking at oil gathering bees. They not only gather pollen and nectar, but they uh, gather oils as well from floral blossoms. One of the students in the Van Engelsdorp Bee Lab works with the State Highway Administration on a grant that manages vegetation along roadsides and highways in the state so that they support pollinator life. Um, and part of her research involved monitoring and surveying for bee species along these areas and to determine which um, vegetation management practices and cutting practices and pesticide application practices or herbicide application practices rather for the vegetation would best support um, these bees. So this gives you a sense of what happens in the lab. So um, the students are out there, either they're netting or trapping bees, and you might think, why is this important to do? Well, if we didn't do this, you would probably never see any of these bees. They, they're sort of flying under the radar. You might see a big carpenter bee or a bumblebee out on a blossom somewhere, but many of these bee species are so small, we don't even notice them. And we don't even know they're there, but it's important to monitor for their presence. So we have numbers to put to these species like, oh, we can see what species there are. Maybe there's a new species. Maybe there's a species in decline. But without doing this trapping, um, we don't have any answers to that question. So this research really is focused in the native bee world around the abundance and diversity of these species. And this gives you a sense of bees that were trapped in different areas. They're sort of grouped according to where they were caught and trapped. They're then washed in a washing machine in a little bundle uh, kept with their group and uh, sudsy water and then they're strained um, and then they're put in a dryer and then pinned as you saw them previously. Now this gives you a sense of how that might look in the field. So one of my field, my summer field projects a couple of years ago revolved around looking at the abundance and diversity of native bee species in sand mines. And there are these old sand mines in Southern Maryland and Anne Arundel County and over in Delaware that are abandoned. But they're a hotbed for native bee, bee, bee species because they can burrow into the sand easily. And there um, is great diversity found there. So uh, this is Gabby on the right, an undergraduate uh, field assistant uh, who worked with me one summer and we went out and we monitored for these bee species within the mines themselves, these old abandoned sand mines, and then along, along adjacent roadsides. Um, and this was a continuation of a research project of a visiting PhD student who made this part of her uh, PhD dissertation work. So this is Gabby on the right. Um, we've taken these uh, traps, we've unloaded them and now we're straining them. We then put them into bags of alcohol. Then they're put in the refrigerator until um, we can get to the work that I described earlier that involves washing and drying them and pinning them as you saw uh, that picture early on of Victor uh, who spends a lot of time pinning and identifying bees for us. So this gives you a sense of one of the um, projects that we have going. This is our pollinator meadow initiative that the bee lab has partnered with um, nine different partners around the state of Maryland. And Rachel described um, the work of the Honey Bee Lab, and I was talking a little bit about the Native Bee Lab, but, and there are different problems that honeybees and native bees have, but the one thing that those bees all have in common is the need for floral resources, good nutrition in the form of diversity of flowers, mostly native plant species. So we partnered um, with these um, public partners and private partners and solar farms to establish these wildflower pollinator meadows for bees and other pollinating insects. This is the city of New Carrollton. This is their city hall. Um, and before they had in this spot a very sort of um, heavy with annual flowers, not very helpful for bees. And the landscape, uh, head of the landscape department for the city of New Carrollton and the mayor of New Carrollton really wanted to transition from these annual plants that really didn't do much for pollinators into sort of these wildflower areas. So this was a great project that we took on with them. And this was the beginning of what it looked like before we planted. And now we have a mixed sort of landscaped bed with some shrubs and some native, native shrubs, native trees, 
and also native wildflowers on the right. So this is a picture from a couple of weeks ago that shows this meadow in its second year. And this is another project that we have with the University of Maryland golf course, where we just took a small swath of land as you come into the golf course, there's sort of an entry driveway and it was just grass on the side of the um, course. And we did this very large swath of um, wildflower meadow and it can take some time to establish between three to five years, but here it is in its second year, very heavy with black eyed Susans, but now the whole area is teeming with pollinating insects. And this is because if you look at the golf course itself, that grass and all turf grass doesn't really offer much of anything to um, bees or other pollinators in the way of food or nesting areas. And this little swath of, um, well, large swath of native um, flowering wildflowers really gives them something to eat. Um, and it's really beautiful too, and it's easier to manage, requires less maintenance on the part of the gar golf course staff. So it really is the way to go and um, a nice, a nice planting area. This is another uh, meadow restoration project that we did off of Adelphi Road in University Park, just outside of College Park. It was um, a place where the town had to um, uh, dig up some piping from underground. There was like a grass patch. This was just an old weedy grassy lot and they wanted to make a wildflower meadow here because they're gonna have a, a path, a bike path that goes through with some benches for people to sit. And so they have actual um, committees of residents that are there, uh, the green committee, and they have the stream committee and the invasive plant committee, but now they have a wildflower committee. And we all work together, um, not only to seed this meadow, but to help manage it. It's in its second year now. Uh, the first year, which was last year, it didn't look this nice. It's a little scraggly the first year, but you just have to sort of see it through because the beauty of these meadows is that every year some new plant species becomes dominant and it looks more beautiful it goes, as it goes along. So they're saving on these weekly costs of mowing and the output of, you know, um, uh, uh, gas and, 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 and energy in and, and that form. And what this requires in the end is will eventually be just a cutting in the fall once a year, which really cuts down on all that maintenance and at the same time provides all of these great flowers for butterflies and moths and bees and wasps and flies. Um, so it's just a great project. So uh, what's going on with the Bee Lab now? So if we were in person, we might be giving this tour in person. Um, many of the graduate students are carrying on with their work at, from home. Some are in the labs in um, sort of solitary ways right now, just starting to get into the lab again, because many of the students um, who are working on honeybee or varroa mite issues um, are working within the lab setting. My research in particular is more out in the field um, so I have, um, I've transitioned from doing a, a, like different sites that that was a, my original plan and I cut back and I'm now conducting that outdoor research in North Baltimore County where I live. So it's a little bit more accessible. And then I have a little makeshift lab that I put together with a microscope and my own kind of bee processing system up here to go through what Victor normally would be helping with. But um, I, um, I'm doing that here at home in, in the best way I can. So we're carrying on because we need to find ways to carry on. Um, and I'll hand it over to Rachel if you had anything to add from the standpoint of how um, you're carrying on with the research in, in these times. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, despite, you know, being locked down since, gosh, February, um, we are kind of continuing things as normal as we can. Um, so for example, the process that I showed you early in the video where we use the shaker and all that, one, someone from our lab, Heather, she actually has that all set up in her garage. And so she is processing samples in her garage. And, um, and I go and, um, you know, we wear our masks and I pick up samples from her. And then I take them back to my house and um, 
I have a microscope set up at my house, um, actually in my bedroom, and I do do samples in, in my bedroom. So I have lab equipment there. Um, I'm actually at University of Maryland right now. Um, so I usually, I come in once a week just to check on things because we're actually still getting in um, bee samples here. So we have to come in and pick up samples, um, you know, at least once a week and do that. So um, it's, it's a bit different, but we're making it work. Um, and, and, you know, talking to Heather, she's not here to talk to you right now, but, but she says that she loves it. She, she gets up and she goes down to her garage and she starts work. So in a sense, it's nice. Um, you know, we've gotten used to this new normal. Um, and it is kind of nice to just wake up and your lab's right there. So um, there at home. So, you know, obviously we miss out on a lot of things. For example, you know, the social interaction with our colleagues, um, but we're making the best of that with Zoom calls and things like that. So it's becoming more normal. Um, but, you know, here at the university right now, there's not many people here, only people who really, really need to truly be here are here. And we're all you know, staying apart, wearing masks at all times. I'm in my office by myself right now. So um, that's why I have my mask off. But, um, you know, everything here at the university, everyone's being very careful. Um, yes. And, um, and yeah. I, will say, I will say too, we're carrying on with um, outreach and extension talks as best we can virtually. So recently, um, and every summer, the, um, the Agriculture College sponsors a camp for um, teenagers, an agricultural camp. And they manage, and usually it's in person, and the Bee Lab has participated in that in the past by taking students out to the bee yard, which is in back of the um, greenhouse. There are maybe nine or 10 um, honeybee colonies back there. And we talk a little bit about the importance of honeybees and what's going in the, on in the hive. This year we transitioned to a virtual presentation. So there were, I'd say maybe about 25 um, campers who were on the Zoom call and we had a, a PowerPoint about the importance of honeybees and also native bees that a graduate student and I presented. And then the other graduate student, Christina, um, taped herself in the bee yard just using her phone and did a great examination of the beehive. Showed the campers, the frames of bees, what was going on, what the beekeeper is looking for. And then she took some bees back into the lab and showed them a little bit about the mite work that she does with Varroa mites and, and how she's carrying on with her research. Um, so we're trying to carry on in that way. Another graduate student, the one I mentioned earlier, who does the roadside work, um, and I did a presentation virtually to pesticide applicators. So all the pesticide applicators in the state need to be recertified each year. Um, and this was a component, um, the pollinators on the roadsides of that educational recertification that they, they obtain each year through the State Highway Administration. So we're finding ways to carry on and to, to do outreach and communicate about the importance of, of bees um, in the context of both campers and folks that work with um, pesticide application in the state. Yeah, and just to add on, so our lab um, has, gosh, I don't know, probably a couple hundred honeybee hives um, that um, Andrew Garavito is our apiary manager, and he has been working all through, you know, the entire shutdown because, you know, bees don't know that, <laughs> you know, it's working just as hard as normal. Normal. So, um, yeah, he's been working through all of this and still working and maintaining those hives so that way the researchers in our lab can still do their trials that they were working on this summer. Um, so, in a sense, it hasn't slowed us down too much. <laughs> or, or, you know, it, it maybe a little at first, but I think we've caught up since then. So. Well, that's really great to hear because you're doing such important work that's really having an actual impact in the state of Maryland and in the country. So it's really encouraging to hear how you all have adapted to the, the situation now. And, um, and that was great. I really felt like I was there with you and got even deeper into some of the things that you've been doing. 
So thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.